basically a deal was made and southern members of the house and the senate said we won't worry so much about tariffs and things you guys want just let us alone and civil rights would be abandoned till 18 or till 1964 with the next where there would actually be a law to end the what's going to become the jim crow laws in the south and the Republican Party will be very split still over this, but it's going to be more and more the party of business and business interests in the North. And Reconstruction is over. And so that's where you get this lost opportunity. But the thing was, 1877, we're going to have Redeemer government, governments that take over the entire South. Redeemer or Bourbons. The entire South. But there was already an economic issue that pretty much made sure that the former slaves are going to be second-class citizens. The economy of the South was in tatters this whole time. And I saved it. I didn't do it during the Reconstruction. I was more politics and social. But for former slaves, they were originally promised in this new economy of the South there was talk of 40 acres and a mule. In fact, Sherman ordered plantations to be divided up in this area right here along South Carolina, the Georgian coast, and the, the former slaves would be given 40 acres in a mule from their master. There was talk of this, 1866 talk of this. That came to nothing. To this day, there has never been any compensation to the former slaves or the descendants. Not only compensation for the hell they went through, the torture, of being kidnapped and having their families broke up, but also for all the money they made for other people. Nothing to this day. It's actually kind of remarkable. And so now you have a real problem. 1866, the economy's in shambles. Landlord, landlords still have land, but they have no money and no one to work the land. Former slaves, what do they have? Their hands, labor. And that's where you get this weird meeting of we have land, we have land, you have labor, come together. And don't forget, there's no money. There's no money in the South. So the, basically, everyone's starting from scratch. The landlords are clearly better off because they have land that use collateral to borrow money. But the former slaves and also most poor whites have nothing. Thus, this meeting would come together, and that's why I put a mule for the 40 acres and a mule, to tenant farmers. Tenant farmers go back to the beginnings of you know, private property and people with enough force to hold on to their property. People pay rent. They pay rent, and these are tenant farmers in Texas, the, those are in Alabama. The thing about the rent is this. They can't pay their rent until they get their crop. So at the beginning of the year, they have to find some kind of collateral to say, we'll pay the rent off when we harvest the crop. And what is the collateral? Their crop. And this is what we call a crop lien. Essentially, they put a lien on their crop. I know it's spelled weird, but that's how they spell it. A crop lien. So basically what it, basically what it is, is that in fall, in the fall, when their rent is due, they have to pay. If they don't have enough money to pay back their rent, the landlord takes the crop. If you go in and buy a car, let's say you're gonna to go to a bank and borrow money to buy a car, they will put, you will sign a lien on your car. So if you don't make your payments, what happens? You take your car. And that's what happens, that's how that works. So it's a crop lien. I think you might see the problem. Is it only the rent, they're renting for this. What else do you need to farm? Hmm? Soil. So the soil, that's the land. land. So you're renting that, you got the land, but what else? Yeah. All the seed, all the tools, your um, the mule, and the harness, and the food for that. But not only that, food for your family and a place to live. Where do they get that? They have to borrow that too. And so that means they're putting a crop lien on all their necessities. And that's why I do want you to get down because you see how fast I think. So think about how fast this builds up. So they got to put a lien on everything, the crop lien for everything they need. 
Can you guess what happens when they finally do sell the crop? Do they have enough to pay? Which, by the way, so let's say we put a lien on 50% of your crop. You don't pay their debt, you pay, and so therefore 50% of your crop is gone. How much money do you have now? Aren't you even in a deeper hole? One bad year? What if the locusts come through? What if there's a drought? And by the way, there was, there was a really bad string of locusts at this time. Like 50,000 grasshoppers going through a few acres, eating everything, including the paint off of houses. <coughs> Trying to get the switch. <laughs> so, you lead to a cycle of debt. They start debt, can't pay back their debt, so they can borrow more money, which means they make your problem, which means more they lose and they can't pay back their debt, which they can't, which means more debt, and so on and so on. Now you might think, whoa, the landlords are losing. No, they're getting the crop. And unlike slavery, the tenants are on their own. They just put little plots of land, divvied it up to the tenant farmer, and they have to find their own home, their own shelter, their own clothing. You just give them the crop. And crop lean tenant farming turned into, because it's a trap, it always is to share profit. And I'll explain the movement in just a second. But it goes from a rent to just simply a share of the crop. We just turn the crop lead to, hey, you got to pay the 80% of your crop to live here. And this shows the percentage of, by county, the more rent, the greater percentage of share of offers. And this, is, this map, I just want to give you an idea how widespread it is. It's kind of a worthless map. Because what does 35 to 80% mean? I mean, there's a big difference between 35 and 80% of share. Sure. That's a huge difference. But I just want to show how widespread it was. But it was not just here. Share crop will become really predominant in the Plains and the Midwest states, too. Yeah. That's one of those maps I kind of thought, well, it shows a percent, but it doesn't really give Well, it's not just free and former slaves, it's poor whites too are now stuck in the system. And they can't get out, but there was a problem for the landlords as they saw. Actually one problem. Let's not get to the problem first. Let me tell you one big thing, advantage they have. If once they become sharecroppers and they say, I I get 80% of your crop, they're not gonna let the farmer grow whatever they want, the sharecropper. They're gonna tell you, 80% of your crop must be what? What kind of crops? Cotton, other cash crops. Which I don't know if you know this, but you can't eat cotton. Well, you can, but you won't be happy afterwards. Think of the paradox. They live on some of the most fertile land in the world, and they will soon be starving. Because they have to grow cash crops. And then, since they have no other way to make money, they have to grow other cash crops just to get their basic necessities, which means they're not growing food. They say, oh, your farmers grow food. You can't grow food because they're stuck. But then the landlords were worried. What if the sharecroppers just say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going west. I'm going to go up to Illinois. I'm going to get out of here. What about movement of sharecroppers? One of the very first things Redeemer governments did as soon as they took power is they put restrictions on movement. What they said is this, tenant farmers or sharecroppers can't move until they pay back their debt. They can't move until they pay back their debt. So when can they move? And then here's the best part. The debt is transferable to your family, to your children. So you can't move, children can't move, Gradual You're stuck. What have you just created? Not only a cycle of debt, but they, they, they become what do we call them? Okay, they're not quite slaves, are they? They're close. Slaves. Hmm? Slaves. 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 Uh, they're not really working for a wage anymore, even though they're kind of the same. I mean, no, feudal Europe. What do they call the peasants? Have you ever heard of the term serf? 
That's a set to what they are. They're bound to the land, and they're in this cycle of death. They can never get out. What a great way to control people. Yeah. Once you pay, well, I got to pay back that debt, or you go to jail or something. Which, by the way, if you go to jail, that means you can still be a what? The Thirteenth Amendment got rid of slavery. This is kind of a trap, isn't it? Oh. And out of this system, then, once you have the restrictions, it's no coincidence that the Jim Crow laws, which we know about this, I'll explain Jim Crow in just a second, but the main area is this was racial segregation. But many of the Jim Crow laws were about debt, to bind people by debt, saying they must pay it back, <laughs> and also to be imprisoned for debt. To fill the prisons up, so you have slave labor. Jim Crow laws were designed to imprison as many people as possible. So it's more than just racial segregation, as horrible as that was. It's more than the debt restrictions. So, first off, Jim Crow was a minstrel show, which was kind of a, they would sing and dance. It was called the Jim, um, well, in fact, there's a handbill for Jim Crow. Here is the actual sheet music, the Jim Crow Jubilee, and it was just kind of a bunch of, they would sing and they would dance. It was some European and African influence, but a lot of it by the 1850s through, through, through the rest of the century was kind of making fun of African Americans, making fun of slaves. Dixie was a minstrel show, and written by Northern. Nobody knows why Jim Crow became synonymous with the segregation laws. There's all kinds of stories. No one really knows why this not really that popular minstrel show became synonymous with that system. Where all you had to say was Jim Crow and the Jim Crow South. And that is a picture, that's a good little cartoony thing you could buy of Jim Crow. Remember those pictures of Sambo? That's that same racial stereotype. And I thought this was a good picture. It's a pretty famous one, but this is Charlotte, North Carolina. And the upstairs, that's the colored section, the peanut gallery, the cheap seats, in a segregated movie theater. And I thought this one was really interesting because it gives you an idea how long this lasted, but that's the segregated U.S. Army in World War II. One of the justifications to commit so much to fight Nazi Germany was because it represented ultimate racism. And yet, that's the U.S. So there's a lot of contradictions here, but that's an interesting way to look at. We'll come back to this idea, but there's also one more thing. Why this is so important. This, these laws, that is the definition of racism. Racism, remember, is not just prejudice. So it's not something you can say, hey, let's just all get along and it's over. No, it is an insidious system. Too many S's. It's insidious method to control or to put one race above another using laws, customs, and economics. Isn't this the definition of that? Setting up a system where it's customary to separate and divide the races because they're different. Laws favor one race over the other, and it helps perpetuate an economic system of one race over the other. Where by definition, you're creating a permanent lower class. And my definition I gave you of racism, now which I've given you many times, if you didn't know that, you better write that down again. Because one of the myths about racism is that you can just simply say, hey, we all like each other and it's over. No, its tentacles go everywhere. It's a really insidious process, a really insidious process. And one more thing. Even if they segregate it into separate, they're perfectly equal, exactly equal facilities and equal business opportunities and everything equal, it's not equal. Because racism in this concept, especially the racism that racism we develop here, was we must keep them separate because of want. That's what we gotta get down. It's an uncomfortable thing, but a white supremacy. White is on top and everybody else is on the bottom. And you might say, oh, this is only applied to African Americans. Remember when I talked about um, racism on the plantation and the difference between household help 
and plantations. You remember that? Now, households, health retrieval, a little better, partially, it's able to you're less black, you're more white. Well, that fits in with other people who are not of European descent. They're darker, so they must be inferior. But maybe better than Africans. Yeah, racism is really insidious. It can fit to all different levels. This will be the most racist time in history. Not just in the U.S., but in the world. It's no coincidence that right after the Civil War, this intensely racist time will be the destruction of the plantations. It's no coincidence that you're having mostly European powers to conquer, colonize, and exploit Africa and Asia, saying that they are superior. And it is in this era that will be the height of anti-Semitism. What's anti-Semitism? It's actually anybody from that Arab Peninsula, but most people think, think of that. It's Jewish. Yes, exactly right. So this is the most racist time. We'll get to more about that in just a second. But also, if this is a law, you've got to make sure that laws can't be changed. So the Mississippi plan would be the best example that every state of the former Confederacy would use. How do you keep blacks from voting and therefore destroy the Republican vote? You keep, well, it's twofold. First off, just terror, violence, intimidation. You lose your farm, or maybe get beat up, or maybe even tortured to death, aka lynched, to keep people from voting. And this is a classic example of the kind of the stereotype how it happened, even though it wasn't really like this. But there's enough of that that happened. But also legal, legal voter suppression to put laws in place that make it difficult for certain people to vote. Not just blacks, but also the poor in the South. There are two examples. One's a poll tax. And a poll tax is specifically designed to keep poor people from voting. And the thing is, you might say, well, the tax is not that high. But if you make it hard to vote and somebody doesn't vote, can't really afford it anyways, and once they get used to not voting, they pass it on to their children, and that's you know, why vote? It doesn't matter. But the most common way would be that grandfather's clause. If your grandfather did not vote, you have to pass a literacy test. The literacy test is not reading and writing, like can you read? It's your knowledge of government. So basically, it's an incredibly difficult test that's designed to not pass. People are not supposed to pass. And yeah, this will keep slaves from voting because. Or, Descendants of slaves because slaves couldn't vote. But people keep immigrants from voting too. We keep a lot of people from voting. So it's not just blacks, even though it would effectively keep blacks from voting. And I'll explain these pictures in just one second. Eventually, this will be found unconstitutional, even though they would keep the literacy test, it's not necessarily graded. An AP government, hopefully, you'll take it this year. Yes. If not pass. Not say this year, next year. The AP government next year. It's really hard. I have the Alabama 1954. It's unreal how hard it is. And once we get this pattern of people not voting, so here are people lined up to go vote. That's a former soldier. They know it to make them look like Jefferson Davis. That's a clever one. And here, one less vote. It's implying murder, but it's just basic. You couldn't vote. And this is what we have to get. By 1900, over, so we don't know the exact number, but over 95% of eligible black voters could not vote by 1900. Over 95%. It's almost certainly higher, but we don't know the exact amount. And every state was different, but say like Mississippi, South Carolina, <laughs> no, Alabama. <clears throat> Those states that first joined the Confederacy, blacks just didn't vote. Virginia, maybe a little bit more. So how do you change the laws? And these have a system where just simply blacks just don't vote. And this is the way it would be in the South all the way till 19, anybody know the year? 1965. Which is really not that long ago when you think about it. And thus we have the New South. 
And as I said, this is the most racist time in our history. That's why it's called the Mayor of Racism. And a lot of that's going to be personified by the numbers of lynchings that would go on. And it's not that the numbers were sky high. It was the fact that nobody was punished for them, and they were nationwide, almost always a black man, but it could be others, and others who were not of European descent, or sometimes whites who try to help blacks. But look at, doesn't look like almost like a, having fun, I'm posing with this man who was tortured to death. Here, the body was burnt sometime. I didn't want to think about it. I would, when I hear lynching, I think of hanging, but it's literally torturing somebody. So it could be a whole awful process. And this is meant to intimidate. And nobody was ever arrested, well, punished for this. Because murder is a state crime. So until the Senate just voted to ban lynching, literally right before Christmas break. And we'll see if the House, now the House will. Yeah, the House will probably vote. I can't imagine the president wouldn't sign it, but you never know. And these are this 1889 to 1918, the number of lynchings. It's probably more than this because it's hard to say what is a lynching while well, somebody goes up, you know, state to the deep south. So Texas is the highest, but they're all pretty high. But look how many in Montana. And here's the thing the lynching was done. Is there anywhere it wasn't? Hmm? Oh, no, it's nationwide. You know, you, it doesn't look like Vermont and New Hampshire, but probably just because it was almost all white people there. Yeah. Monte, the big thing was railroad workers along the railroads. And when the Klan would pick up again after 1913, the Klan was not here. The Klan were not lynching people. The Klan was here. And the lynching was done to make sure that Blacks or people who are not white, Catholics or Jews or people that would stay out. That's what the Klan. Yeah. Why would there be? Yeah, that I found that interesting. Why not Utah? Because there were, well, back then the Mormon Church would not allow people back to the And so very few blacks would go there for that reason. But still, railroad workers, especially in the southern part of the state, so that does surprise me. Maybe they sat on the mountains. I don't know. And so, and this, and that's in Topeka, Kansas. And the reason I put that up there, not only to show you how terrifying that would be, but also all spread out. But think about Kansas. You remember bleeding Kansas, right? And, you know, the free stage and free soil. But it also shows one of the problems that um, the North, you know, they were thinking we want to end slavery to make a white republic. Kansas would be one of the most racist and segregated states in the Union. And it kind of represented that whole free soil movement. In fact, the law that would desegregate the school, or not the law, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court decision, 1954, was Brown versus the Topeka. Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. And so that gives you an idea how widespread that was. And so, oh. Now this one, I, I like this, but it also, I don't like this one. I like this because it shows some of the attitudes, but this is an anti-lynching cartoon. That's killing the baby here, which is lynching. And it says Southern Chivalry. Like they're supposed to be gentlemen. And it said, if I hadn't killed you, you would have grown grown up to rule me. It's hard to say grow up. But the thing is, that gives a interesting look at what was going on. It's implying that the people doing it were uneducated, poor whites. No. They were sharecropping. And the big landlords who ran the south it was the elite they're the ones who did it if this cartoon like this let them off the hook it lets the people who are actually in charge off the hook it wasn't us it was those uneducated ones 
which is kind of a myth that goes on to this day. But the South would then politically become the Solid South. It voted Democratic pretty much all the way till 1964. It's the party, because Republicans were the party of Lincoln. And especially going into the 20th century, you know, Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats disagreed on a lot of things, especially things like civil rights, as shown by there's John Kennedy, 1960, who supported civil rights legislation. And he had, but he still had to go down south to Georgia to try to get votes there, because that's where Southern votes were. And I thought that picture was a good one because Georgia had just changed her flag by the Confederate battle flag to show that they're anti-civil rights. And so that gives you an idea of what happened. And so that would be what would change. Civil rights, we'll get to it, called the Southern Strategy. And 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. This, the Southern Pacific Railroad actually paid for Homer Plessy to take this to court about segregated railway cars because it was too expensive for them. They thought they wanted to cut costs. It's expensive to have two separate cars. But the Supreme Court ruled seven to two that separate but equal facilities were constitutional. And this gives a big stretch to the idea of equal and also the 14th Amendment. It pretty much just throws the 14th Amendment completely out now. And it would begin to be overturned in the early 1950s, most common, best known as Brown versus the Board of Education. But they can never be equal because the reason they're separate was this racist idea of white supremacy. And so that's Plessy versus Ferguson. Another thing that came out of this was the lost cause myth that the Southerners were fighting not for slavery, but for a noble cause. By the way, what was that cause? Yeah, this states' rights turned into this fight for freedom from Northern tyranny. That states' rights. We just wanted to govern ourselves and northern tyranny. So when you write down lost cause, make sure you put down something about that. It wasn't about slavery. In fact, it would be the lost cause myth by the 1880s where it would become, in fact, a way to perpetuate that myth would be to say it wasn't a civil war, it was a war between what? The states. And that's where that came about, the lost cause. And so, just the beginning of this, and it'll really pick up in the 20th century. This is a monument to, to Robert E. Lee. And the Confederate battle flag came out as an example of this lost cause myth. And this is a neo Confederate rally two years ago in Charleston, South Carolina, using the same Confederate flag. And it represented that lost cause myth. And how, lost cause myth. And what's it? The Gallup poll I saw, last one I saw about this last year, I think it pulls a little bit of grain of salt. But well over 60% of the population said that slavery was not the main cause of the Civil War. And that would have been quite a shock to the guys who actually started the Civil War, you know, to, the, to the states that seceded, and the states that fought to keep them in. And this was a really popular kind of lost cause song. It's actually a very catchy tune called I'm a Good Old Rebel. I will not be reconstructed. And rebel turned from being fighting against slavery to fighting for my freedom. And fitting hand in hand with this would be the Reconstruction myth. That Reconstruction actually proved the lost cause because Reconstruction was a northern invasion. And this would be personified better than any other method by the new motion picture industry, especially one of the greatest movies ever made and one of the most racist movies ever made, Birth of a Nation from 1913 by D.W. Griffin. And in it, he lays out as the villain being the North who tried to put in black misrule. This is a white man in black face. That was very commonly done. He wouldn't have actually have an actor of African descent if you a white person put black. Or like and if there had American Indians, it'd be a white person with a tan, you know, that kind of thing. And here is another example of that. And the heroes who are just stopping the black misrule and northern misrule. Who are the heroes? The Ku Klux Klan. Who, if you look, don't they look like they're wearing plungers on their head? But it's the Klan. And 1913, in the basement of the White House, Woodrow Wilson saw this, and this is the quote he gave that 
Griffin then put on one of the slides in the movie. And it says, if you can't read it, the white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. And that's President Woodrow Wilson, who was a history professor and then president of Princeton College. He was a Virginian who moved up to New Jersey. And this would personify that Reconstruction myth. In fact, I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal this movie was. Why do you think the clan reemerged? A way to keep out the others came from this movie. The clan appeared all over, not in the South so much, a little bit in Georgia and Louisiana, but especially in what took over the state of Indiana. Like the clan really took over. And Wilson was president in 1913 to 1921 and was probably the most racist president in American history. He would, and he also did some things I would argue are good. I mean, people are complex, but he was the one who segregated the federal government, including the brand new, the brand new uh, Lincoln Memorial. Little ironic twist there. And the Klan began to pick up after this. In fact, the biggest era of Confederate monuments came right with this movie. Yeah. Oh, sure ID. So let me finish this quickly about the Confederate monuments. The Confederate mo monuments were built as a combination of lost cause, but also they built them right in the middle of black neighborhoods to make sure that everybody knew. That one right there, Lee Circle, Louisiana, and uh, New Orleans. They put that, literally put that right on the edge of that segregated neighborhoods of I mean, a black neighborhood. So anybody leaving that neighborhood had to pass Lee statue. That wasn't because, hey, let's go honor Lee. No, that was, hey, who's in charge? In fact, the daughters of the American Revolution became really big. She was more in short ID. And, oh, and I will get, I couldn't get it into the grade book. I thought this was really interesting. Here's the ugliest Confederate monument ever. That's Nathan Bedford Forrest in Tennessee. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Yeah, I wonder which one this came from. Right after Birth of a Nation, that's when Helena built it. Got taken down last year. The furthest North Confederate monument was in Helena after the Birth of a Nation. So that movie had great effect. That's when the biggest wave of the monument. So it was, it was a come out of something. So there's a number on this. If I can give the other one too. Here, let's do this. Make yourself useful. Let me hand back the other one too. How many multiple questions? Multiple choice questions are on the test. Uh, there's like 25 or 25 multiple choices and some matching. Matching. No matter how much I do this, you're not going to be first period. <laughs> Did I get that to you? Yeah. Oh. I'm nervous. Sorry about that, I wasn't thinking. That's the problem when I'm trying to talk and do something. Okay, the score out 100 written on this. Okay. Either. Over the shoulder. So. Well, the bad part is you don't want to I don't know. I got Oh, what was the anniversary on that day to get the test? Yeah, South Carolina seceded. Oh, I'm so insecure. I'll give you a short idea. Uh, I need that. 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 I
Yeah, yeah right. Ooh, you would have had that one. That was the one. I'll talk to you about it. Yeah. Right. Remind me tomorrow. I'll give you. Oh. I have yours somewhere. I'll probably get it. That's okay. It's okay. I knew when I was writing it that that was the one Limo month is gone for you uh, forever. That's exactly what I was afraid of. It's the last limo month ever. Ever. Never again for you unless you. Let it please. Oh, yeah, give me a I said, are you really the kind of person who has a place for us? 
this is the time to Pass it up, paper, and the with the quiz. Wow. Yeah, you got to take it. Pass paper, number one to ten. Alex feels pretty confident right now. Don't be so sure. I just want to be very clear about it. I was ready for this. Okay. No, I mean, happy I'm ready. I do want you, but it would be out it's only 90% of your don't worry about it. And it will go on your permanent record. So my criminal record. Huh? Yeah, on your criminal record. All right. We're finally back, people. Finally. Number one. What treaty ended World War One? Let me phrase that. Name all four treaties that ended. No, just what major treaty ended. There are four. Wait, was that actually a question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a question. <laughs> Number two. The spelling count. Huh? The spelling count? Yes. Number two. What is the name given? To when you, or what is the name for when you give into aggression? You give into aggression hoping they'll stop just at that. What is that called? Giving into aggression. It's called Why are we doing that? Because it's a Wednesday. <laughs> Number four. Let me check. I, let's go two. Okay, number three. In 1938, in 1938, what piece of land was given to Germany as probably the best example of the pieces? I'll give you a hint. It's not Wyoming. What piece of land that's part of a country? If you look at this map, you'll find that it's not here. <laughs> it's in the Carpathian Mountains. Does that help? <laughs> it's really pretty. Lots of water. Number three. Now, this is a good one. Here's the one all of you should know for number four. Who was the British Prime Minister who came back waving a piece of paper after the agreement that gave up that piece of land saying war will be over in our time? So he'd be kind of be, he'd be this symbol of appeasement, carrying an umbrella, 
Gee, wouldn't that be a way they could show maybe like candy on the message right now? <laughs> oh, one more thing. If you want, his dad was the colonial secretary for the 1890s. That's what we call tidbits that are stuck in my brain and I can't get out. Five. Who did Germany sign a non aggression pact with in 1939? Shocking why <laughs> Just why? Everyone else. Did everybody to Casper? They're so not old. <laughs> Number six. What was the name for the military tactic devised by a German general by the name of Heinz Scuderian? To try to win the war quickly to avoid using as few resources as possible. Which was that? Six. Six. Okay. Six. By Heinz Guderi. Did he make <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Number seven, nineteen twenty three. In 1923, what happened to Germany after the French occupied the Ruhr Valley and couldn't collect taxes? What happened to Germany? You know it. You know it. Eight. Who led the black shirts and became the fascist dictator of Italy? Oh, Here we go. Hey, number nine. What was the? It's actually amazing. French fort, name of the French fortifications along the Franco-German border. I made the 1930s. What was it called? They're amazing. We should take a field trip. When I say we, I of course mean me. No, yeah, me. That's where I witnessed a guy in French making fun of a pole. It was a, it was a, it's one of those experiences you can only have in the map. Ten. Number 10. In 1939-1940, the Soviet Union attacked, boom, triggering what's called the Winter War. Who did they attack? In fact, the Soviets did so poorly against a smaller country that kind of helped convince Germany they'd be a pushover. 1940, the Winter War. This could be Wyoming. <laughs> Bonus question. What worldwide event would allow the Nazis to take power in Germany? January of 1933. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have any questions. I can. Any other questions? And I will for you because I care. I just gave the bonus. Yeah, what worldwide event would allow Hitler to take power? The Nazis take power in Germany in January 1930. It was this event. Yeah. Number four. The British Prime Minister, who was best known for signing away that big part, or that, for giving in to German aggression. Who was the British Prime Minister? Number nine. What was the French fortified line? Yes. Number 10. Winter War, who did the Soviet Union attack? Did not do well, at least at first. I know the name of the British Prime Minister. I know his face. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Number 11. Number 11. 
Okay. Who's in the 70s? First time ever flown a plane was 1938. Anything else? All right, let us grade it. You can grade your own. Number one. Now, there are actually four treaties in, in World War I, but we always lump them together with the treaty signed just with Germany. And even though it was negotiated in what city? Paris. Paris. The city of, the city of France. Yes. <laughs> Paris. The Treaty of Versailles. Yes. I have no idea how to spell that. I just found a really cool picture of all these soldiers from different countries like standing on like ledges, all this stuff, looking over at them signing the treaty. It's a really cool picture. It's, it's such a good picture that I could really explain the picture without showing it to you. I'm scared to freeze my computer again. Number two. Uh, what's the name of giving into aggression? Appeasement. Number three, what is it? The Sudetenland, which is the West of Czechoslovakia. And then you get a wrong. I know. Gotta be harsh. Hey, so you gotta make cool. Even though you're close, not proud of you. Number four. The Rhineland? Yeah, is that France? Rhineland's, even, Rhineland's the western edge of Germany. So Rhineland actually is the area between the Rhine River and their western border. So like we're in Luxembourg. On this map, it's right about here. <laughs> There is another map. Guys, where are we? Four. Four. Who is it? Prime Minister? Churchill was actually a major critic of his. His name was Neville Chamberlain. His father was Joseph Chamberlain, colonial secretary right after the Boer War. Five. Who did who, who did who did uh, Germany sign a the Soviet Union? There was no Russia. Six. What military tactic did Hans Scuderian? Which does mean lightning war. It really wasn't nothing, it wasn't really anything new, except for the fact that they wouldn't focus all their tanks at one spot. And they actually didn't have very many or good tanks. Yeah, dive bomb. Yeah. Put your head down again. I don't know who that is. Sweets are neutral. Number <laughs> Number six. What would it was caused when the French occupied the world? Watch. Oh, I, that's the wrong question. Oh, number seven. That's hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. No. Huh? Not mean inflation. Because there's a lot, there could be a lot of different reasons for a depression, a lot of, but that would specifically led to hyperinflation. They basically could not collect money anymore, money of value, and so nobody trusted the currency anymore because they had nothing to back it up. Eight, who became the fascist dictator of Italy? Benito Mussolini. The name of the line. The national line. Named after a French foreign minister who fought it for done. And the Winter War was between the Soviet Union and Finland. Oh, I said, what? Got a land in there. And what event? Worldwide event. The Great Depression. <laughs> the Von Papen government collapsed. <laughs> All right, who got seven or better? Yeah. Is it seven? All right, all of you got seven or better. I want it. I got 
Which I know plus one. So then take off eight. Who got none correct and don't want to raise their hand? Wow. <laughs> Who got ten? I got close. Got nine? Who got hyperinflation? Who got the Sudetenland? Who got Chamberlain? <laughs> oh, that was the one that got everybody. Who who did not get appeasement and is really mad at themselves? Because that's one y'all y'all. All right, eight. If you got seven or above, I want it. And then we're going to come back and tell the whole thing. I we can do. Who who got the Great Depression correct? Very good. Who got Paul von Hindenburg for any of them? All right. So this is what we're going to do. Next week, I will. I'll try to remember. I try to make up a list for you guys for the semester test. The semester test will be. What did we say it's going to be again? Now. Trades. And while we throw various objects on the back of the home magic, yes. We gotta add a degree of difficulty. Don't be magic a short ID. I'll try to make a list up for you to give you an idea, but there'll be a few questions on toys, Vietnam War music, uh from crime, a lot of that stuff on there, and the 2008 crash, and then just a few questions for the rest of the year, and this one. So actually the big thing is gonna be kind of the Two, the two biggest areas are going to be the 2008 crash, and we're going to do the beginnings of World War II. So we're going to go through some of the events that led up to the years, up to World War II, through France. And, oh, actually, Battle of Berlin is my plan. And the reason why is it kind of fits in pretty good here. There's good things we can watch. Uh, it's good history. And then sometimes second semester, I would like to do D-Day through the end of the war. It's not really inspirational. And I didn't notice it. A what's I had so many former students coming here on the Friday before the break that there's so many people coming in and out. I didn't know who was doing what. Did you leave your keys? Yeah, I got it, and I got to tell my note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I left my car on box, though, so I oh. sit in my car as I switch. Don't say that. I love it. 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 That's loot. All right, so let's go take your notes out there, and we'll do a few things about this. We're going to watch. i got to tell you much detail, but I like going through this because so many things happen, and we'll have to cover a little bit about America, too. Even though America is obviously going to be directly involved in this, it's going to be one of these amazing events like World War I, where so much will change forever about the United States. And most of these events that will change us forever happen without American influence at all. It's kind of amazing how that happened. In World War I, you really notice it, but you see it in World War II. And we should add who won World War I? I did. I don't know. Yeah, you can make the argument nobody won. Here's the thing. After World War One, basically, the United States, what did they do after the war? First off, the Treaty of Versailles, watch well, all, all the treaties, when they came back, it requires what vote in the Senate? Uh, two thirds. Two -thirds. If it's a two thirds vote, what happened to the treaty in the United States? The Senate did not ratify that treaty. And so the United States never was a party to that, or Woodrow Wilson, the president who would, in many ways, at least at the beginning, have such an influence on it, it turned out he would be out in the river and didn't know what was going on, he probably had the flu. 
he, he got really sick, and it probably was the Spanish flu. Was he doing the spread in the entire of Europe? <laughs> <laughs> he was typhoid. No, he. No, but he caught it there. And oh, I should add, I didn't find this out to the middle of next of last week. <laughs> the middle of last week. So I mentioned that they were going to show that they will not grow old. The documentary, they were going to show it two days, and that second day they decided not to show it at the theater. And I did call, and a few other people called, and I found out the Wednesday it's going to be shown on Thursday that they were show they, they did show it. Yeah. Only in the more only at the one o'clock and four o'clock showing. It was not scheduled till like I guess last last Tuesday, which really made me sad. So you didn't go. I went. But I didn't really know how to tell anybody else. And somebody else went. I saw a talker there. Anybody else see it? You remember the video, the thing I was talking about? Yeah, it was, it was really well done. And I don't know if anybody else called, but I, but I, I know I called. I know a few other people. You called? You called and didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't believe they did. I, I, I really just like pure luck that I found out because I didn't know. You know, I just I just did one to call. I think it's really bad. This person called. Okay, I'll write it down. You know, <laughs> but I think that's what happened. Enough people called. So, two things about that. First off, if they do sell it, I'll make sure our department gets it. So I can watch it with next year's class. No, well, then if we do get it, I'll, do, I'll just show it. Whatever day I get, we'll just show it. We'll watch it. The only problem is it's a, it's three D, and I don't know how we'll do. That's we'll get the. We'll get the red So I'm ready, <laughs> but the rest. Of you. <laughs> Okay, so back to this. So Germany, so the United States did not ratify the treaty, so the U.S. did not join. What was, Wilson basically was allowed himself to be outmaneuvered. The treaty was far too complex beyond him, but what was created that Wilson thought would solve all the world's problems? Now, the League of Nations and the United States was never a member. The U.S. actually sent a representative to Geneva, and the U.S. would be involved in some of the negotiations like on the periphery, like when the Geneva Accords were ratified to try to make war more humane. The U.S. was a signatory to it. And other agreements, the U.S. would be part of it. But technically, the U.S. was not involved. And so with so many things are going to happen. The U.S. was not involved in the League of Nations. So this was at a time of isolations. The U.S. was isolated. But I should add, the U.S. wasn't always like that. Before World War I was one at the time of, of the greatest global trade in world history. In fact, in some ways, more than today. I think because not so much that we trade more volume of material, but how the, the global trade just exploded from almost nothing to a more interconnected world than ever before. Ever before. Before World War I, and then they blew the whole thing up. Literally. Literally. And so the 1920s, the U.S. is isolated, but I do want you to get this down. World trade had gone down dramatically and would not pick up again until the 1950s. And even then, you're not going to see real globalization until the 1960s. And so we have this world that was not as interconnected as it was before. So that the thought was so many people, in fact, when people look back at World War II, they, they have this assumption that, okay, the war ended, it kind of went back to World War I, and there was a depression. No, it, you had this, in a way, this less connected system that there wasn't as much trade, and therefore, countries were really much more susceptible to economic downturns. There would be a worldwide depression in 1919, 1920. There would be a couple other downturns, but then the 1929 Great Depression, there was no cushion with trade. That's one of the reasons why it was so bad. They weren't really trading in the 1920s. And then, when the Great Depression hit, people had a surplus. One of the things about the Great Depression, you're producing more goods than what people can buy. 
No one's trading. So you can't sell to anybody. And so that is one of the things about those interwar years that made it so much worse. Just basically everybody was broke. And then we have to add one more thing. During the war, virtually every country that entered the war was on the gold standard. As soon as the war began, they got off the gold standard. What, pray tell, is the gold standard? Yes. The value, of basically. the value of your money is based upon gold, but it's much more complex than that. Because it has to be an international system that everybody must agree. Yeah, that gold is worth something. And therefore, we can pay our currency, basically saying that we'll buy this much gold. So it has to be an international system. So it's more than just saying, hey, gold money or gold is worth our money. It has to be the system. So you're not, there's not going to be a gold standard until about the 1870s. And then it became like this symbol of stability. And did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, but I don't know. Oh. And World War I, everyone got off. Except for the U.S., but the U.S. entered the war land. For a lot of reasons. Why does everyone go off the gold standard? That, you want to inflate your currency so you can buy more. And you inflate your currency, yeah, you get out of debt a lot faster. I know there could be other problems, but well, hyperinflation doesn't come that far. Hyperinflation comes if no one believes your currency is worth it. You can still do things with like interest rates and things like that to make your currency worth something. But what happened was during the war, because they needed more money, they got off the gold standard. The U.S. could, for one very good reason, or the U.S. stayed on the gold standard, is because the United States, when they traded if they made a ton of money selling to the Allies, what did they demand in payment? Gold. Gold. So we had a big surplus of gold. Now, it would lead to there are economic problems, but this is what we got to get. Everybody after the war at some time went back on the gold center. Everybody. Even Germany in 1923, part of what they did to get out of hyperinflation was going the gold standard. Now, the gold standard has a lot of Big, big, big problems. But one of the biggies is if you have inflated currency that's based upon your ability to collect taxes and your ability to control interest rates, whatever it might be, and all of a sudden you go from that to paying the money to gold, what happens to the value of currency? The old currency drops to nothing, but the new currency paid to gold goes up in value. Because it's paid to gold. That meant that every country who did that created deflation. What is the first major cause of an economic depression? Deflation. And so they all kind of did it to themselves. We're going to show that we're a stable country. And they went back. Now, when times were good, the, the value... They're able to still make wealth, but when times got bad, they couldn't adjust. And so that's a few of the economic things. Now, one more thing. What happened all across Europe after the war ended? Yeah, Civil War kept going after the war ended. The fighting did not end. It was horrific all over. Was literally asking which world war. Yeah. Oh, did that say which world war? Yeah, I, I was asking. Which you can say the same thing about both wars. Now, as you can see from this map, Russia greatly expanded in this era. There we go. So. All over, all over Central and Eastern Europe raged war. First off, in 1917, what happened in Petrograd? Obviously, yeah, Petrograd, they changed the St. Petersburg to Petrograd, so they the Germany. Communist revolution in Russia, creating eventually the Soviet Union. And they went through a hellacious civil war. Poland was created out of the Treaty of Versailles, but only 60% of the population of the new Poland were actually Poles. This is actually a good example of Poland to show you all the problems. What other people live there? 
These are all Germans right here. These are all Germans. Now they're part of Poland. What else? Austrians. Austrians are Germans. There's Czechs. There's Ruthians, which are right here, which are Ukrainians. There's Croatians. Oh, they're all, many of them are Slavs. But, yeah, well, that's, they're Hungarians right there. There's also Russians, they're Lithuanians. You see the problem they have? And a significant population of Jews. You see the same thing happening all over the new country of Yugoslavia, which is a mess. And there was civil war in this whole area. And so the thing about it was, is that there's this constant sense of disruption, that a war was on the edge of happening. But no place bigger than Germany. So we're going to watch just a few minutes of World War II and Color of the Gathering Storm. We're going to watch it in Germany. I'm showing you this because it does a good job explaining a little bit what happened in Germany. But at the same time, we can't go into too much depth here. And I can stop it and show you a few things. Sound good? That's not it. Uh, I lost it. 